Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. As most of you regular viewers to our show know, for the past many, many weeks, we have featured a great deal of film that our U.S. Farm Report crew shot on a field trip, taking us to the states of Texas, California, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Accompanying our crew was Mr. W.W. W. Butch Swain, Director of Public Information for NFO. The gentleman on my right, who is my special guest today. Butch, it's only proper, I think, as we go back out to those areas to revisit some of the people uh, that you be with us. That was a great trip, wasn't it? Real fine. Some great leaders in agriculture we met on that trip. You bet there were. You know, everybody was so very hospitable to us, and I know that you like to talk about the friendliness of NFO members, but in addition to being hospitable and friendly, it was so evident to me that these people, the leaders at the local level, were truly outstanding. And herein lies, in a great part, the strength of the organization, right? Right, and the friendly attitude. You see, Bill, we have a philosophy in NFO that there are no strangers in NFO, just friends you haven't met yet. Yes. And I think you found that out on yes, this trip. Yes, We have another philosophy that we've lived by in this. Get acquainted with your neighbor. You might like him. We like for him to be friendly with everybody. Mm -hmm. We think the farmers are all in this together. Well, now, about this leadership, uh, we talk a great deal, Butch, about the leadership of NFO at the national level in Corning, Iowa, and this is vitally important. There are some 135 outstanding people at the national level working hard every day and night in behalf of NFO, but without the support of the people out at the local level, it might not be so easy, right? Right, Bill. You have to have top leadership all out through the country. We've had enough leadership, developed enough leadership in NFO that we can have and conduct over 300 meetings a night, five nights a week, for the past five years, and it's much higher than that now. That many meetings a week? That many meetings per week. And it takes a lot of leadership in order to bring this about, because in order to get these meetings up, you have to have a lot of leaders helping. You have to have leadership to conduct the meetings, leadership to carry the ball for agriculture. Well, let's meet some of these people through the five states uh, we visited. We perhaps uh, should call today's U.S. Farm Report, Butch, a field trip revisited. Near Arbuckle, California, we visited with NFO member Charlie Geyer, who talked with us about one of California's many, many, many specialty commodities. This particular commodity, almonds, or as they say it out there, Almonds. Charlie, you have how many acres uh, in almonds? We have uh, 300 acres of bearing almonds here in Arbuckle. And uh, you and Chet are combined with a couple of other almond producers here into the Arbuckle... Almond Company. Almond yes. Company here. What will your total combined production of almonds be? It'll be in, in the uh, realm of a half a million pounds of shelled almond meats, clean meats. Uh, mm -hmm. This is uh, with the hull and, and shell taken off of them. Well, now, of course, there's more to the almond crop than the nut itself. You, uh, you get the hull and the shell, which uh, is uh, purchased and goes into cattle feed, as I understand it. Yes, in the early days of, of almond raising, why the hull and shell was burned or discarded uh, any way that they could. And in the last 15 years, uh, we've started selling them for cattle feed. Uh, we had a good price to start with, and then it seemed like all the price got away from us. Uh, I don't know why, it, it just did. Uh, now, last year, they bought almond hulls in, in the Arbuckle area for $3 a ton. And through NFO this year, we've blocked our hulls together, and we have sold hulls for a net of $15 a ton to growers in this area. We've got a considerable amount of hulls stored, and we're plan on selling them through supply contracts mm -hmm. this winter. 
How, uh, how long have you and uh, Chet been members of NFO? Since uh, January of uh, 1968, mm -hmm. uh, Ralph Kittleson come out here and, and uh, told us the NFO story, and we took it right away. Well, it's been a great thing for you. Uh, you know, if, if nothing else has happened, it's been a great thing because of this uh, increase in what you're getting for those almond hulls. Yes, this is uh, right. We hope to do something with the almonds. Uh, it sells the meats, but as of yet, we haven't really developed uh, any real sound program. Well, let me ask you this, Charlie. Where do you think the expansion potential is in almonds? Well, the biggest market, I feel, is to people that the almonds aren't available to them. Uh, they know something about almonds, but uh, the almonds you've seen here today, Bill, uh, they don't see. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, in the Middle West, uh, the East Coast, uh, this is what we hope to do. Uh, get these almonds out and in a form, a shape that, that they're ready for them to cook themselves or process themselves. Uh, they're a, a real, in, in Europe, they use them for a staple. Most of the people in California or where they are sold domestically, they're a luxury item. Mm -hmm. The amount of production that's going to be in the almond crop, they're expecting maybe uh, 120 million pounds this year, and maybe in three to four years, 150 million to 200 million. If we're going to sell this amount of production, we've got to get it out to the people. The almonds have been the non-surplus item in the last three or four years. We've developed real good export markets, Germany, West Germany, Japan, France, Great Britain, but uh, we can't rely on these markets by ourselves because uh, the Mediterranean produces approximately as many almonds as we do, and they're going to take their share of these markets. So for us to get rid of these almonds or to sell these almonds uh, in an economic, advantageous economically, why we, we've got to develop markets of our own. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about uh, uh, some of the methods that you're employing here. Now, in the old days, as I understand it, in order to get these nuts off of the trees, it was a hand job. It was just plain hard labor, wasn't it? Yeah. What it, did you use? Well, we had a sled uh, on two wheels drawn with a horse or a tractor, and it had two sheets that went out underneath each tree, and uh, the men went and knocked them with a maul or a mm -hmm. pole, and uh, they went down on the sheets, and then they were rolled into the sled and taken into the huller. Uh, now we have went to uh, completely mechanized. Some people, as far as even knocking the almonds off the tree, we haven't went that far yet. But uh, you are picking them up yeah. mechanically, aren't we, you? We pick them up, wind roll mechanically, and pick them up mechanically. Mm -hmm. uh, from there on, uh, they're not really touched by a human hand, hardly, mm -hmm. except for maybe minor cleaning. Well, now, in years past, as an almond grower, you have picked them up and hauled them someplace else for all of the rest of the processing to get them to the, to the consumer, right? Yes. But you're is... changing things now, aren't you, Charlie? Well, yes, this is right. We've formed the Ammon, Arbuckle Ammon Company, and we're going to process these almonds into 100-pound bags, clean, grated, ready to eat. Uh, they're not cooked, but ready to eat on a fresh produce sort mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. This is relatively different than what we've done or anybody else in this area is doing. Everybody else selling them to processors who uh, go ahead and do this job we're doing. Mm -hmm. they, they go to the extent of canning them and cooking them and, and this sort of thing, but I'm sure we won't do this. Well, rather quickly, can you sort of trace what happens uh, to the almond in your setup here from the time it's picked up here in the uh, orchard? Well, it's picked up here in the orchard and we take it in and uh, it's got dirt and stones, sticks, and it, we run it through a cleaning mechanism and then through a cracker. Uh, the cracker takes the hull and the shell off. Uh, after it comes out of that process, why it'll have shell and hull and uh, maybe some gummy or wormy meats in it, and then we take it through a cleaner and they're sorted by hand. Uh, they've sorted, semi-sorted through the cleaner and then they run across a belt and mm -hmm. girls pick out the, anything the cleaner doesn't. Then we'll grade them as to count per ounce. Uh, your large almonds will go into a large count per ounce size. Uh, your small almonds in the small count per ounce. We feel that we can get uh, more money out of the big ones and more money out of the small ones and average money out of the mediums. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the reason we do this. Now you're raising here in your orchards uh, 
hard shell almonds, uh, those with a soft shell, and the ones in between. How many total varieties are you uh, are you raising? Well, we have eight varieties. Uh, main one, the nonpareil, which is your number one almond in, in the state of California. Mm -hmm. uh, probably 60 percent our production is nonpareil. Uh, about 15 percent is Texas or Mission. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the old name for the Texas salmon was Texas uh, California Ammon Exchange uh, thought maybe the mission name would be much better. Well, Charlie, uh, let me, may I see this package down here? This uh, happens to be maybe uh, your very first package out of your newfound business here. This happens to be a five-pound package of uh, California shelled almonds, and you're going to package almonds here, what, up to 100-pound uh, sacks, aren't you? Yes, this is right. Uh, we feel that we can develop some markets with a five pound bag or a box and some hundred pound lots. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, this is where we feel uh, if we're going to sell these animals, we have to have them in this condition. Well, I want to wish you a lot of luck in this new undertaking. <laughs> well, it's going to be a big job and take a lot of work, but we'll get the job done. Well, of course, Butch, uh, we had opportunity on that trip to visit many areas of California and many NFO members in California. For example, on recent shows, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that you enjoyed Albert and George Waddy, the cotton growers from Tulare, a couple of fine gentlemen and good NFO members. And of course, Butch, uh, recently we featured Marion White and his son from the Shandon, California area. Amazing, high efficiency, big farming in that area, wouldn't you agree? As I recall it, they were so far ahead in mechanized agriculture that the University of California brought the classes out there to study mechanized agriculture. Exactly right. They did that. Now, we even uh, managed to uh, get down through the great central valley of California, as you know. And will you ever forget that late afternoon that I think I suggested we take a scenic route through the Carmel Valley? And uh, it was, what, 35 <laughs> miles long, and three hours later we completed it. And it was dark most of the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was something to remember. I think it's always fun to look back on some of those crazy experiences on a trip uh, like we took. Well, from the state of California, you will recall, Butch, that we then went northward and we uh, went into Oregon. And uh, in fact, we're going to revisit at this moment the farm of George and Doug Fernbacher near the town of Prineville, Oregon. Doug, as I understand it, uh, your farming operation here near Prineville is a father-son partnership, right? Right, right. Any more uh, Fernbackers in this family? Nope, nope. That were just the two of us. He's uh, he's all right, isn't he, George? For an only son, they're they're supposed to be a little troublesome. I think he's doing yeah. okay. I'm glad he's here. I'll tell you the <laughs> truth. <laughs> I'll bet you are. Yeah. How many acres uh, do you farm here? We farm roughly a thousand with our what we own and what we rent. And what is your production on the thousand acres, uh, Doug? You mean per crop wise? Yes. Oh, we uh, produce about roughly 1,800 ton of potatoes, and we run about all oh, roughly 1,500 head of cattle, and then the rest of it goes into feed for these cattle. Right. Let's get back to your potato production here. You're highly mechanized, I suppose, to try to achieve some efficiency in this potato crop. Correct. And uh, what has this done for you price-wise in this area? Well, the price has gone down considerably. Uh, when we moved to this area in 49, my dad received $3 a sack for potatoes. And at that time, we had much more expensive operation because it was all, you know, hand labor. Uh -huh. And now, 20 years later, the price today is $2.10 a hundred weight. And we have cut our costs per and harvesting down some. But our cost for fertilizer and our land values and everything have gone up, so the price is way out of line with what we've actually saved by going mechanization. Well, fellas, wherever we go across the country, gleaning the agricultural story for U.S. Farm Report, uh, the story remains pretty much the same. Uh, George, I'm sure you've been through it for years. Efficiency right. is going up. Production costs are going up, but what's happening to the prices? Prices going down. There you definitely. are. Definitely. There you are. Yeah, we just got a tax statement yesterday, and for our operation here, it went up over $700 from last year. 
Well, what about the uh, fellows in this area in the potato business? Uh, have you uh, have you plowed some under? Oh, yes, yes. We plowed 4% uh, of our, our crop under this year. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about price, George? Do you have any idea about what to do about it? Yes, just as soon as uh, the good members in this area get their potatoes under storage, we're going to go to fighting, and we're going to get this price up, or they're not going to get them. Well, this is one of the one of the really great advantages of organizing, of uh, getting together, of working together, and blocking together, isn't this it, under is NFO? True. Just like I talked to a man in Jefferson County last night, and uh, he talked to the people in Klamath, and uh, the communication in this thing is the most wonderful thing I've ever got into. Uh, before, the buyers, they used to uh, tell us one thing, we had to believe it. Now all we got to do is pick up a telephone. We know what's going on back east, the middle west, and any place you want to know. It's the greatest group I've ever got into. I think the communication probably is the greatest factor in solving so many of these problems. It used to it, be that you guys had to believe uh, right. just about anything that anybody wanted to tell you, and this you really right. had no authoritative source for information. But now, indeed, you do have, right? Oh, this is wonderful. You bet. We can get the answers in a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. You bet. Let's talk about your uh, cattle operation here. How many cattle do you run, Doug? Well, we start out buying in the fall, and uh, depending on how good a summer we had for feed, we normally buy between 1,500 and 2,500. Mm -hmm. And we do some custom feeding. And then we start, as they get up to, oh, say, 750 pounds, we start putting them in the feedlot. And then those that we don't put in the feedlot in the winter, we go to pasture with. And what kind of pasture is it? Is it grass? It's all plant? irrigated yeah. pasture, yes. Mm -hmm. It's a mix of legume and grasses. Right. And then um, in the summer, as once again, we go through about, oh, once every 30 to 60 days, and we cut out the big ones and put them on a finishing feed also. Mm -hmm. Now, what's your cattle market? It's, uh, it was real good, and now it's slipping very fast. We... Uh, we have a problem out here in that we don't have enough of the feeders NFO yet. Mm -hmm. And so consequently in this area, a lot of us are backing up and selling feeders instead of selling finished animals. Mm -hmm. And Dad and I are seriously considering doing this with what we have left this year. Well now, with, with your fat cattle, uh, can't you uh, block them elsewhere in the country and get a price under NFO? Uh, this is, we're trying to work out a deal now. We have a little problem with transportation, of course, doing this. And, uh, but we've got one packer over in the Willamette Valley that's working with us 100%, and he takes our NFO beef, and he's paying us more than market, but he can only do so much when mm -hmm. the big boys keep undercutting him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, just like Dad and I sold a load of heifers yesterday, weighing about 900 pounds, all choice for 2550 and uh, this is not a break-even no. deal. Yeah. George, you made some comments to me a little while ago that I found to be very interesting about the uh, rural businessman and the small community. Now, for example, in Prineville, which I guess is your community, right. your mailing address, uh, the support that uh, you feel is coming from the businessman who is realizing that uh, the strength of your economy out on the farm is indeed the strength of his economy in the town. This is right. No, if, uh, if they let corporations take over here, our little town of Prineville will be a ghost town because uh, we spend our money here. Prineville is a, a going community, I a think. A real going community. What's the population there? About 70, 7,200, 70, 200, yes. I believe, yeah. It looks prosperous. It has a good look about it. Right, Of right. course, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of, uh, of the lumber industry yes. in, in the Prineville area, too, isn't there? Yes, uh, lumber, uh, what is it? It isn't, uh, I think agriculture still leads in Prineville. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know the percentage, but. Uh, we have already <clears throat> explained to our audience that this is uh, sportsman's paradise, this country. Right. You yes, bet. indeed. I suppose you guys uh, do find a little time to pursue that uh, that hobby, don't you? Uh, yeah, we we get to do our share, <laughs> I think, of deer hunting, bird yeah. hunting. Right. Now you're raising grain, barley and wheat. Right. Uh, you've had no market on that either. Oh, have it's you? terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. How much are you raising? How many acres of your land is in grain? Oh, what about a third? About 350 acres. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you storing, George? 
we're storing and, and then feed to our fat cattle. Uh -huh. uh, it's no price today. It's about 40 bucks a ton. Yeah. It's way below our cost. Well, now, <clears throat> although NFO in this area numerically isn't exactly as strong as we would like, right. it's coming, isn't it's it? It's coming fast, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've been doing a lot of hard work, as I understand it, we in try behalf to. of the organization. Uh, is the influence of NFO felt to a point where you're able to, uh, as an individual, make some uh, some contracts or gentlemen's agreements with the people to whom you sell yes. to your advantage? Would you explain that? Well, yes, it's increased. Well, like on cattle, we're getting about a half a cent more than the other are. And uh, potatoes, they're willing to talk to us for a little better price. Uh, grain hasn't been yet, but we feel that it's coming. Mm -hmm. It's well, going to take time. Tell them about last year when uh, we got the three dollars, and they didn't believe us in taking a dollar eighty-five, twenty-five miles from us. Yeah, what about that? Well, um, yeah, the uh, the boys here said they wasn't going to let any potatoes go less than three dollars a hundred weight, net to the grower. Mm -hmm. And the boys twenty twenty-five miles away from us, they laughed at us, said it can't be done. Well, these boys here are good, strong NFOs, and they wow. just uh, set on them. There wasn't a spud left the Prineville Valley under three dollars a hundred net to the grower. Mm -hmm. Well, NFO is being felt here, felt advantageously, as, as I see it. Although uh, there are no existing contracts at this time, you're, you're looking for those. Right. And they're going to happen, aren't they? You bet. Upon our arrival here, we looked up to see Doug and his dad, George, on horses coming up to greet us. And they were accompanied by what looked like a herd of dogs. <laughs> <laughs> now, that isn't so strange to have dogs on a ranch, but... Uh, I am intrigued by the fact that you have two St. Bernards and another dog uh, that is a, a really a, a rare breed as far as I'm concerned. I've never seen this breed of dog before. How come St. Bernards, Doug? I've always been in love with them since I was a little tiny kid, and I built a trailer for a fella that raises them, and he gave me one, and then he gave Dad one, and then we started raising them. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand it's not a bad crop. A lot better paying than any other thing we can raise. Uh, I don't sure. know. Uh, I don't know whether uh, we can do anything about raising prices on St. Bernard's through NFO, <laughs> but I guess we could give her a try, couldn't we, George? <laughs> you bet we'll <laughs> give her a try. Now, this other dog uh, that I was talking about, what breed of dog is this? He's a Norwegian Elkhound. And uh, they came from Norway. They were used both as a work animal and also to hunt game. Mm-hmm. Is he a pretty tough uh, animal? He uh, He's a fairly small dog for a sled dog, I would Right, say. they're a muscular animal. Dad's um, border collie thinks he's an awful tough animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Doug and George, it's been a real pleasure talking with you all, and uh, I want to wish you well, lots of good luck, and uh, certainly we're hoping that uh, NFO grows as we're anticipating it will grow through this part of Oregon. If I can say one more thing, this is one thing that I have learned and met the nicest people through NFO, people at, uh, all over the world, uh, United States, I yes. should say. Uh -huh. And, uh, well, they're people you like to be with. We have, I think, uh, concluded on this particular field trip, during which time we have covered the states of Texas, California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Colorado that, number one, progressive farmers belong to NFO, and number two, and even perhaps more importantly, that NFO farmers are the greatest people in the world, just from the standpoint of being nice folks, being hospitable, cooperative, and helpful. And you two people uh, certainly fall into that category, and we thank you, and it's been a pleasure having you on U.S. Farm Report. Butch, it makes me want to go back. It was a great trip, and I only wish that on today's show we could revisit all of those fine people we met in Texas, California, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And incidentally, as you well know, we are planning another field trip for later on this spring, and I hope that we get to your area. If we could get all of those people on one show, it would prove to the world that progressive farmers join NFO Bill. Yes, indeed. And they're paying off in another way, too, in the words that we've won in the competition. 
of our television and our advertising. And why don't you tell the audience oh, about it here? I'd be glad to, Butch. If you will allow us just a moment of, uh, of boasting. We're really not boasting, but we feel so very thrilled about this, and we'd like for our audience to share our pleasure with us. The National Agriculture Advertising and Marketing Association annually has advertising awards. Hundreds of farm advertisers compete in these awards for their creative work. I am very pleased today to announce that this year, NAMA, as this organization is called, presented a first place award to NFO for the best single ad, two or three color. Now this first place award was won out of a field of over 100 entries. This is an ad that appeared in the Farm Journal. Right. Right, Butch? The leading magazine for farmers. Yes, indeed. And we're delighted to receive this award from NAMA. The other first place award from NAMA was awarded to U.S. Farm Report. Now, naturally, selfishly, I am absolutely thrilled and, and delighted that we receive this kind of award from this kind of competition. The judges ruled that U.S. Farm Report was the best public relations film that they looked at, and as a result, NFO was awarded a first place plaque for this show. Now, I want to mention the show that happened to win this first place award. You perhaps will remember a show featuring Gene Potter, who is the director of the Meat Commodities Department here at NFO, and one of his assistants, Andy Knightsling, who is in charge of uh, cattle plants. This show happened to be shot at a packing company and it dealt with the quality and yield grading of beef carcasses. In case you missed it, since it is an award-winning show, we're going to repeat that show next week. I hope you'll be watching at that time. Butch, thank you very much. It's You're always welcome, a pleasure man. to have you on our show. Well, I'm glad to be here, and I'm looking forward to that next field trip and more footage of outstanding farmers in America. And I am too, and uh, we'll get it and be back here with it. And uh, thanks to all of you for looking in today. My special guest, Mr. W.W. W. Butch Swain, who is Director of Public Information of the National Farmers Organization. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week on this station. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.